Hi, I'm Alex. Um, I built a stable coin on Substrate. Um, I am a runtime engineer at Perry, and um, yeah, I, I'll be introducing a non-collateralized stable coin today um, because I figured that was a good way of demonstrating what Substrate can do, and I think it's interesting technically, sort of, and economically what what they uh, have to offer. Um, yeah, do you want me to jump into the presentation or? Uh, yeah, sure. That that sounds good. So I know there's like, um, maybe just for context here, like I know there's a couple different ways to do stable coins and I, I haven't dived very deep into them. Like I know that one is the sort of like simplest one that like Tether does or claims to do or whatever, where you just collateralize one to one. And I think this is a sort of a, a different approach that's in many ways more interesting. So if you know, talk about that whenever you're ready, I guess. Yeah, yeah that, that's sort of part of the presentation. That, that was cool. my plan to, to start with Awesome. That. Cool. Yeah, as I said, I'm Alex, Runtime Engineer at Parity, for the people that joined. Uh, and I'm presenting a stable coin today. So I built a, a sample stable coin. So it's not production ready, disclaimer right here. Um, and it's a non-collateralized stable coin. If you don't know what any of those words mean, um, that's what this presentation is about. And then we'll jump into some a demo later and, and the code later. If you want to have a look, um, this presentation, hi, you don't have the presentation link yet. I'll drop those two links for you. Okay, cool, you thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I got ahead of myself. The stablecoin and the, the basis white paper link. Um, so I'll introduce stablecoins, what they are and the different kinds. Um, I'll go over that fairly quickly to then focus on the economic model of basis. Basis is a non-collateralized stablecoin that is now defunct. I think um, they don't exist anymore, but I think the basic model is, is sound. Uh, I'll go into that, and then I'll go into the implementation strategy, um, and then um, a little bit into the implementation and sort of what that looks like, and then I'll show a demo on, on how to use the thing with the Polkadot's uh, UI. And yeah, and then of course I'm open for questions at any time, so if you confuse what I'm talking about, then feel free to jump in, um, and, and I'll, I'll explain as best I can. All right, uh, what are stable coins? Um, the motivation behind stable coins is that the Bitcoin price or the price of other cryptocurrencies is very volatile, right? It, it changes rapidly. You have, um, I don't know, changes of 100% over like very short time periods. I don't know whether they've managed to do that in days before, but it, it changes very rapidly. So I, I have two charts here that sort of show this contrast between Bitcoin, the left, which changed from $4,800 to $13,000 within the last year, um, which is like a difference, like uh, nearly a factor of three, right? Like two and a half, three uh, between the lowest and the highest price, while USD coin, uh, which is a stable coin, uh, fluctuated between 0 0.99 and $1.03, um, which is quite a bit less. So that's sort of the goal, right? To go, to go, to have a cryptocurrency that um, is stable relative relative to some asset. And here's the first thing: um, it's stable. It's trying to be stable relative to the asset. So if the U.S. dollar were to um, hit hyperinflation, right? Like I don't know the German mark. Deutsche Mark uh, in the 20s of the last century, then like it would not be really be stable, right? It would follow that inflation. But um, as long as the sort of asset or basket of assets is stable, the cryptocurrency is uh, will be stable as well. And I just uh, gave the Wikipedia definition here because I think it's it's very apt. So um, those are stable coins. And now the question is like, how do we track the 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 price of that uh, of that asset? Um, and there are a different kinds of strategies of doing that. And here I'll follow the, um, the sort of the categories uh, Center has um, shown or like mentioned in their white paper. So Center is the, um, I think the company behind USD coin, um, as far as, uh, if I remember correctly. So they, they built one particular stable coin and they sort of have this white paper where they give this, um, these categories. And the first kind is already the fiat collateralized. Um, and it's the one that Josh you already mentioned. It's this very simple idea of one-to-one -one mapping. So um, similarly to how the U.S. Central Bank used to have gold that would back the U.S. dollar, which they don't do anymore, 
um, you have um, fiat currency, for example, US dollars in a bank account somewhere, and then uh, you give out coins sort of corresponding to those dollars. And the idea is to have one dollar in that bank account corresponding to one stable coin in the wild. And of course, you can do this with other things. Like uh, I think in, in the last year or something, there, yeah, a year or two, there were a bunch that are trying to track gold, for example, right? And then the idea is that you have um, one ounce of gold for every stable coin, something like that. Uh, I think it could also be called asset collateralized, right? But whatever. Okay, so this is the first kind. It's very, very simple algorithmically. Um, and the difficulty here is sort of building up the trust. You know, there's like a lot of controversy around Tether because like apparently they don't always have this one-to-one -one mapping and they're doing other shady things that I don't know. I'm not deep into, into that particular thing, but the, the complexity is in, in the trust and the, the, the sort of the system of this one-to-one -one mapping. The crypto part of this is very simple, right? You just have you just have a token and then you just issue new tokens or, or, or take them back corresponding to you people paying you money. The second kind is crypto collateralized. It's um, DAI is one of the most well-known by the MakerDAO um, ki uh, kinds of um, stable coin. And what they do is um, it, one, it's crypto collateralized because they use Ethereum or Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies as collateral. But the other key thing is that it's over collateralized. So part of how they get their stability is that they um, force you to lock up more currency than the value that you're getting out. So you lock up, for example, $200 worth of Ethereum. And for that, you get $100 worth of DAI uh, of, their, of a stable coin. And then if the uh, value of Ethereum, for example, fluctuates, the thing that you locked up, then that doesn't mean that the stable coin um, has to change price as well. And then they have some other... Um, mechanisms for how they adjust supply um, to keep that price. And this brings us to the third kind of uh, stable coin, which is uh, an algorithmic kind. So I already mentioned basis earlier, and here the algorithm provides the stability um, via supply tweaking. Uh, so the supply is adjusted um, according to the, the price on the market. So if the price is um, to if it's worth too much, the price is too high, then um, we want to send out more coins. We want to increase the supply. Uh, and if the price is too low, if it's worth too little, then we want to decrease the supply in order to, to, to balance that. And this is achieved. So um, in the crypto collateralized scheme, you have uh, external cryptocurrencies like Ethereum that you bind. And in the algorithmic kinds, you actually also do have cryptocurrencies it's or crypto tokens or something. Uh, it's just that they are part of the stable coin. So the stable coin is actually not one coin, but more like three tokens in the, at least in the basis model. I'll come to that in a second. Uh, and that's how you get the stability. You have fluctuating value or you have fluctuations, but not in the stable coin, which is one of the tokens. And then the fourth kind is just a hybrid of the th uh, three above and, and like it's very interesting in that it's, it'll be very complicated, but it's not very interesting in terms of, um, yeah, thinking about it. Um, any questions so far on stable coins? So I, I, you don't have to answer this right now because I guess you'll get to it at the right point, but like just one, just so you know, one thing that I'm wondering is like, I definitely understand what you were saying. Like if the price of this coin that's supposed to be stable starts to go up, then we take some corrective action by like, you know, just issuing more tokens like that should drive the price back down mm -hmm. um, and, and vice versa when the price starts to, to tank. So like the thing that I'm wondering though is um, like, that's good in an abstract sense. It makes perfect sense. But like when you're going to issue new tokens, where do they enter the market? You know, like who gets them and like even worse the other way around when, when we need to take tokens back, like, is it just us skimming off the top of everybody's stash or like, I'm, I'm curious how that part works. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we'll come to in a second. Yeah. Very good question. That's what we'll be covering. I guess okay. I, I know that the federal reserve, when they mint new tokens, they, <laughs> somebody has to get them. So they get them or their friends get them or whatever, but I'm guessing maybe there'll be some other, system that's a little more fair, or at least like transparent or something. Right. Yeah. Um, right. So uh, the, the fiat collateralized one I already mentioned is not very complex. The crypto collateralized I don't very deeply understand and also is not what I implemented. And so we won't cover in, it in detail. And then what we'll be covering now is the third kind, 
yeah. So now um, I want to go into the economic model, the, the theoretical basis behind um, bases, and thus one type of alg uh, algorithmic coin. So first, a bit of sort of context. Um, that I implemented the following the white paper, which I already mentioned, and then. What I did was that I renamed some of them, it, both in this presentation and in my implementation. So I um, just want to make sure that there's no confusion. So the basis tokens are called coins in, 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 my, in my world, in my explanation. And then bond tokens are called bonds, and share tokens are called shares. And this is already what I mentioned earlier, is there are several different types of tokens. And uh, so in some sense, there are three. I'll say later on how, why I think like it, in my implementation, you could maybe even say four. And we will co come to that. So oh, all right. So that's, that's the basis. The three is the stable coin. Right. And coins or bases in the original is the stable coin. OK, cool. Yeah. And the, the others, they're not quite coins also, which we, we'll get to that. So um, this is the, the magic thing. Um, this is the fundamental model, which addresses the, the question that you had. And it's that we have this variable supply. You can see my mouse, correct? Yeah, we see your mouse, or I see it at least. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so um, we have this variable supply of coins that changes and, and adjusts so that the price is stable. Um, and this is a fundamental trade-off it makes, right? Um, and one way is to, as you said, is to hand out coins to your friends. So it's uh, that we have uh, shareholders. So um, in my implementation, it's at initialization. But in principle, these tokens can be uh, tradable. Um, and I think, I think the white paper doesn't say whether they should or should not be tradable. And I think it wouldn't make sense for them to be tradable. Um, but in my implementation, they're not to me to keep it simple. And so you have these share tokens. And if we need to increase the amount of coins, so if the price, if it's too valuable, um, then we can, then one of the things that the, the algorithm does is that it sends out uh, coins to the shareholders. And this is one way of sort of in, uh, like increasing the, the, the coin supply. But then one of the key things is how to decrease coin supply. So how to counteract um, uh, a, a drop in, in price. And this is where sort of the, the basis um, model comes in is they have uh, bonds, which are promises for future payouts. And what you can do is you can buy these bonds, somewhat actually like government bonds. I think that must have been part of why they why they chose that name for them. So you can um, so you can pay nine hundred coins today in order to get a thousand coins at a future at a, at a future date, right? So you make a profit. Um, so as long as you believe that the price will end up at 1,000 again, for example, 1,000 coins for $1, for example. As long as you believe that's the case, right, you can make a profit by paying 900 coins now and getting back 1,000 coins later on. And this is the, the incentive that keeps all systems stable, right? People that, that believe in the coin, believe that it will be stable and that it will reach its price again, they can um, spend coins now to get more coins later. And so coins are converted into bonds. And then we have this bond queue. And if in the future, the price um, increases, so it's worth more again, the value increases, then um, we need to increase the coin supply again. And what do we do? We don't hand out to shareholders straight away. We only do that as a fallback. What we do first is we pay out the bonds of people that have bought bonds in the past. So um, for example, I paid 900, like um, a week ago, the, pri like the value of the stable coin was too low. So I bought 900 coins. Um, I, I paid 900 coins to get a bond. Um, and then this week, the, the value has gone up, right? Other people have found this new stable coin that's amazing. And they, they, right, they went to the, to the exchange and bought some and whatever. Um, and now, um, we need to increase the coin supply again. So now the bond is paid out and I get a thousand coins um, uh, from, from the bond to, uh, to, to my account. And, and this is sort of the, the, basis, ab and the basic ebb and flow, right? Do you convert coins into bonds? Um, you can do that at any time. You can also do that when the price is, is high, although the, the incentive is, is not as, as high as that. Um, 
Um, yeah, but you can still do it. Yeah, so you can always. For, are bonds for sale at any time? Is it is it because it it seems like buying bonds uh, like contracts the coin supply, right? And contracting the coin supply would drive the price up. So like if the, imagine if the price is already high, if it's like, you know, 5% above whatever the target is, can I still buy bonds at that point? And glad that you asked because now we'll add one more thing to the, to the model. So this is sort of, this is just the basis uh, model. And now we sort of get, it's, like it's mostly still described this way in the white paper, but now we get sort of closer to my implementation of it. Um, so the, 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 the basis white paper describes a continuously running auction. Um, and so the, the, there is a bidding system where you can bid for bonds. So you cannot buy bonds. You have to bid for them in an auction. And then the system decides whether you get them or not. So the, or the auction decides whether you get the bonds or not. So this way you can decouple the, the sort of the, the bidding or the, the buying of the bonds from the actual um, reduction in supply and sort of decouple them. So uh, you make bids, right? And then you, at some point you decide, ah, the price that I chose for my bid wasn't very good, so I'm gonna cancel it. And then you make a new bid or other people make bids and so on. And you have this auction and it's continues to running and hopefully has some entries. And then as soon as we need to contract the supply because the, the price went down. Um, we will take some of those bids from the auction and convert them to bonds. And at that point, you cannot cancel them anymore. They, they're gone, they're burnt. Um, and they, they sort of in this bonds queue and wait for the day that um, the, the supply needs to be increased again. So is, this is why you were saying it was sort of like four, maybe like four tokens. The bids is the like sort of fourth one. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's sort of, it's not really because it's just like you reserve some of your coins, right? And then you can get them back again if you, if, if you, if you say like, no, I don't want to, want to convert them. It's just like, yeah. Quick question here. Is this a handout coins arrow that comes from shares bubble? Mm -hmm. Is it the right, is it correct? Is it, or is it an uh, error? Because in the previous slide it was handout uh, shareholders. So the shares to shareholders or? Oh, right. So the, this says hand out to shareholders. So hand out coins. I, I left the coins out because of sort of layout constraints. So this one is hand out coins to shareholders. And this one is, um, is also hand out coins to shareholders. I just uh, I contracted it. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. And that, that means shares are basically the treasury we have in the, or? So um, hmm, maybe this is a confusing way of showing it. Ah, good. Thank you for the feedback uh, in, in some sense. Um, so shares are a separate token or a separate uh, sort of data structure. And um, we sort of, we use the shares to decide how to hand out coins. So if there are no bonds in the system, zero bonds, for example, in the beginning, right? Um, so we are very early in, in the process. We just released our stable coin. There are no bonds. It's empty. And um, people are buying the stable coin because, oh my God, this is new, amazing stable coin by Parity or whatever, the Web3 Web Foundation. And then we need to um, inflate, the, we need to increase the, the coin supply. And then this, the, sort of, this is supposed to mean, and maybe that was confusing, this is supposed to mean that we hand out coins to all the shareholders, right? So the shares tell us who to hand out coins to. In, in I see, okay, thank you. Thank you, Alex. So do the shareholders bear any risk? Because in the system, it kind of sounds like they get free money and then are free to just inject them into the economy. Yeah, so they don't run any risk sort of within the system, really. The risk that they do run is it's very unlikely that you will just get shares, right? You will very likely have an ICO where you need to pay some sort of external currency in order to get shares in the stable coin. So like within the system, you're right. They, they, just, they just benefit. Um, but um, outside of the system, like they will have to do, like they, they, will, have to, um, they will have to invest in order to, to, to get the shares. And also the, the shares are uh, paid out last. So um, I, would, I would imagine that if the, if the system is working correctly, the shareholders will get, will get coins very uh, infrequently because the bonds are always paid out first. It's just a fallback mechanism. 
Okay. Okay. So, so we, when we need to create more tokens, we, we don't go straight to the shareholders. We, in the best scenario, don't have to go to the shareholders at all. We just pay out our bonds, but then I guess like only in the scenario where we've paid out all of the bonds and we still need more tokens, then that's when we go to the shareholders. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And but I'm, in that I'm, yeah. I'm imagining like I know you said that you didn't implement this, but like it's possible and maybe a good idea that the shares could themselves be tradable. So then, you know, if they're tradable and if I'm thinking like, oh, having a share seems like a great thing, you know, I'll maybe I won't get tokens, but maybe I will. And once I have the share, it doesn't cost me anything. But then you kind of have to like estimate the future value of the share and decide how much you're willing to pay for it based on that. And you might overestimate or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine it's not a very liquid market and it will be a bit weird, but yeah. yeah. Another thing that I could imagine actually, now that I'm thinking about it, but also not implemented, it's just me talking about clouds in the sky, uh, castles in the sky, um, is you could have a, a different currency be the shares. So you could say, um, oh, um, all the people that hold dot in the, in the polka dot chain, like everyone that is a, is a dot holder or something, something, or everyone that is part of the um, validators or something, or like something like that, right? They get, um, they get, they are shareholders and they get coins. And then, right, it would be tied to running, um, to running the nodes and so on. And so they would be paid for being the custodians of the network. That's also a possibility in principle. All right. Any more questions? Uh, how much, I think uh, you might've said this, but how much does a bond pay out for? I remember like I can make a bid and I, you know, the best bidders are the ones that get to, to buy them and everything. But like, how, how do I know what the payout value is? Mm-hmm. So the payout value is, so the, the payout value is always one, is sort of always a multiple of one, dollar or the, the, the base unit. So um, here I need to introduce something that they, I think they even mentioned in the white paper and I definitely chose in the implementation is that you don't trade uh, with dollars and coins one for one is that you trade, you have, a, you try to have a fixed um, thing between, for example, 1 million coins and $1. So then the bond payout is, um, is 1 million or some, something like that. Um, and uh, in my implementation, and I think they don't uh, mention this in the white paper. I think they don't. Um, in my implementation, uh, you can freely choose the amount that you would like to receive. And what you pay uh, is a percentage of that. Uh, and this is how you bid. So um, you say, I want a million coins, or I want 10 million, or I want 10 coins. Um, with the exception that it's also something that I added, you have to, um, the amount has to be high enough. So you cannot bid for one coin that's too little. It's like, you know, like sort of, uh, it's a dust avoidance mechanism, right? That you yeah, need to... that wastes a bunch of state space and it's not worth anybody's time. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a, a minimum amount that you need to, that you need to bid. I think it's uh, actually a $1. It's like it's one base, base unit. Um, mm-hmm. So if you're tracking dollars and right, you're tracking $1, then I think the minimum is $1. Um, one, one question related to the bits. Uh, so this auction, what kind of auction is that? Is it English auction? Typical or? Um, it's been a while since I've looked into auctions. I can describe what it is and then you would need to tell me which kind is. <laughs> so so it's, it's a continuously running auction um, where you continuously make bids. The bids are sorted according to the price and the price is comparable um, in that it, the, the prices are all percentages. So you all say, I want a million coins in the future and I'm willing mm-hmm. to pay a price of 0.8, so 80%. Mm-hmm. And then that means that you pay zero, uh, that you pay 80% of how much you, the bond will be worth. You pay now, you're willing to pay now, and then you will get the, the amount in the future. Okay. And it sounds so, like a continuous English auction, but so that, how do you decide the winners there uh, based on... Right, so the, the winners are, um, so when we determine that we need a contraction, so that we need to contract the supply, at that point, um, the, st- the stable coin will pull out bids from the auction and it will pull the bids with the best price of the auction. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. 
It's actually an interesting point that you mentioned, right? I, I remember there are like other types of auctions where the second highest bidder is is setting the yeah. price or something, right? And like I, I think it could be made more sophisticated uh, there, and like maybe there's a bidding scheme that that is is a bit more optimal than what I chose. I chose something very simple. Yeah. Also, it sounds like a Dutch auction a little bit, like the order of you know. Or, you can order the bids based on amounts, how much they want, you know, and then from what price they have, and then the, uh, some duration can decide on, uh, and then uh, this, yeah, it sounds like a Dutch auction to me, actually, as you described more, yeah. So does a bond always pay out in its entirety? Like if it, let's say it comes time that we have to expand the, t the coin supply a little bit, so like, okay, we're gonna pick up, I guess like, oh yeah, how do you even know which bond to pick? Is it just like the order that they were bought in? Mm -hmm. So one of the incentivizations to buy bonds early and not buy them at, at a late point is that um, it's a FIFO queue. So the earliest bonds are paid out first. Um, right. So that's the yeah, reason to buy it early. Okay. And then cool. that's how it's decided. Th that makes sense. So my original question was um, like, imagine we get to a point. The, the question is, is a bond always paid out in its entirety? And I'm, the scenario is I'm imagining like we get to a point where the price of the token is like a little bit too high, nothing crazy, but we just want to do a little bit of expansion. And like the next bond in the queue is for like a million tokens. It's like way too many. Is it like, do we pay that out? And now we have the exact opposite problem or can we like partially pay it out or something? So this is, um, I'm not sure this is mentioned in the white paper. What I chose to do for my implementation is I want to um, allow that the partial payouts. And I'm, I actually don't know whether there's any economic problems with that. But um, in terms of code, I, I decided to do it that way. Yeah. Cool. So if I have like if I if I have a bond for like I don't know like a hundred tokens and mine is at the tip of the FIFO queue and it's time to you know expand a little bit, but we only want to expand by fifty, then I guess like you mint fifty new coins, you give them to me, and I'm left with a bond that's worth fifty now, like just mm -hmm. the difference. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Makes exactly. Sense. That's, that's how it is currently implemented. And similarly, actually for the bids, um, I decided to also make the bids splittable. Um, so if you have a bid over um, 200 coins, but I need to contract by 100, I will, take, um, I will, I, I will assume that you're willing to um, also bid at the same price for half the, the coins and just take half the coins and put them into a bond. Um, so if I only get partially paid out, would I still be first in line for the next payout? Yes, yes, that's also how it's currently implemented. Yeah, so it sort of popped from the from the end of the queue, and then like it subtract subtracts however much it needs to subtract, and then you're pushed again to the to that to the front of the queue. So you're you're always sort of yeah, the 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 oldest uh, bond is always the one that's paid out first. Except okay, so if I so if I had like $10 million, I could just sit at the front of the queue for some extended period of time, just continually getting paid out. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, that might, yeah. Maybe, maybe there would be an argument. But that's okay, because... Be... Yeah, go ahead, Amar. Oh, sorry. Uh, I didn't know, actually. I thought I was on mute, but I, <laughs> I was talking to myself. Um, I think that's okay because like that uh, person would be providing a lot of liquidity to the system. That's hilarious. I was talking to myself, my bad guys. <laughs> oh, good point. So. Yeah. so I think mostly it's not an issue. Um, can I ask a quick question, mm -hmm. Alexander? Yeah. Um, so uh, you've talked about the mechanisms that are used to create inflation or deflation. Have we talked about how and when that decision is made and what mechanisms go into deciding when those things need to occur? Partially. So, so I, I've just said the, the algorithm decides and I, I can show you the code. Actually, I think I'm close to, yeah, I, I think we can jump into the code and then, and then we can have a look at that. And, and it's very simple. Code. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Right, so um, the implementation strategy is just implement a palette that contains this logic that we've been talking about. And then that, that core palette, it expects a price oracle because you need to, to like the, the palette like is on the blockchain, right? It doesn't know what price uh, its, its coin has. And so you need a price oracle that tells it whether it's sort of on track or not. And sort of it's, it's, it expects, 
it expects that uh, price oracle. And then we have a node, uh, a substrate node that sort of ties those two pallets together um, and then sort of make, makes a demo runtime um, to show the thing. And then we can jump into the part of the code. So you were interested in how we decide, right? Um, so we go into the stablecoin palette um, and then um, so the current lo logic is very, very simple. We fetch the price um, on every block. On initialize is executed uh, once for every block. And then um, we execute this, this function. And what it does is it um, just goes via adjustment frequency. So I, I, there's just a configurable number for the stable coin for now that um, determines how often we do an adjustment. And then whenever it's time to do an adjustment, in my demo case, it's every second block because I want to be able to show that quickly, right? And that could be, could be changed. Um, we expand or contract on price. And then we just give in the price, right? And then based on the price, we decide whether to contract or not. So it's, it's sort of very, very simple, straightforward logic that decides on the inflation or deflation. So I have a quick question. So uh, how is the price uh, stable uh, price stability determined? Is it through an Oracle service, or uh, how do you determine the price? Mm -hmm. Right. This is the um, so at the uh, there. So what is is very simple again. This right. This is a sample demo project to show the rough structure. Uh, this is very simple. We just uh, have a fetch price trait that's just an interface that we expect from our context. So th this this um, this palette just says I need a price oracle. I don't care how you give me that price oracle, right? I just always want the current price. And then you can choose an implementation strategy. Actually, one of the things that I didn't put in the uh, in the presentation is that there are different ways of having this kind of um, oracle that's also mentioned in the white paper actually you could have like a, you could have like a prediction market style thing you can have like voting of different like oracles that are then averaged in some way you can have a running average or not like, like all kinds of things right and so for this case for the demo I built a very very simple one it's, it's ridiculously simple it's just like allows me to set a price and then that's the new price. And that's the price oracle, right? And then uh, the other thing, just to show that it's possible, I also included a uh, price fetch, like an off-chain worker that, uh, that goes to, um, I think, CoinTap and, oh, we can have, yeah, it doesn't matter, to some exchange and just pulls the price. And because, of course, our sample coin is not listed, uh, I just get the Ethereum price um, and, and I, Take that as the as the price of our stable coin, um, which makes no sense semantically. It's just to show that you know you can like this could be anything, right? You could just run an off-chain worker that does arbitrarily complex stuff and then get a price out of it, and then that price would be would be available to the the stable coin. So Alexander, going so back to my question right. about how you make how you make that decision, totally made sense to me. Basically, there's. Um, an oracle that feeds the the, the price information, um, and then into the runtime, you code some parameters for how you decide when to, you know, call for an expansion or deflation or whatever. Um, and then you, right now, it's made very simple. But in practical terms, I'm guessing there could be some kind of governance model around that, where you know people decide if those parameters need to be adjusted. That would kind of be in production what this might look like. Sorry, I didn't catch the last Is that part. correct? Um, just kind of, you know, thinking about how this may play out in production and assuming that there would be some governance model on top of those parameters uh, that, that probably, you know, people who had a stake in the network could make votes about changing them and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so I inclu included this one. I, I, I made it a constant, which I feel a bit bad about now because maybe it should have been like more bad because this is one of the things that you might want to adjust, right? Um, the the mm -hmm. community might want to adjust the adjustment frequency so that like instead of um, changing the, like expanding or contracting every 10 seconds, you expand every 10 minutes or something based on how it plays out mm -hmm. in economic reality. And this would totally be something, yeah. You could have a, um, a, 
yeah, like the, yeah, and I di I didn't model it, but but it could definitely be modeled. Yeah, you could instead have a storage item. Yeah, totally. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you proved it out, and now Substrate gives you the tools to implement it in a million different ways. You know, whatever works best for you. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Thank you. No worries. I have a vague feeling that there's still an open question somewhere that um, that are left on the table. So feel free to jump in. Yeah, I was totally going to ask a question, but I can't remember what it was. It'll it'll come back in due course. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Um, all right. We already jumped into the code, so I already talked a little bit about the, the distinction, right? We have the we have the different palettes that provide the logic, and then we have the node, which is sort of the the running thing that we'll be starting in a second, and then we have the runtime, which is sort of which uses the palettes, ties them together. Um, actually, I can show how it ties them together. Right? Yeah, this is how this is how we do the this sort of dependency injection in a sense, right? This is how we we just say, okay, the price module it provides us with the coin price, and so we hand it into the stable coin, um, so it can access the it can fetch the price. Yeah, this is actually a really cool thing that I just wanted to like call out because I see people asking about this all the time about like how you get one palette to depend on another, and like specifically, I know people sometimes accidentally run into cyclic dependency problems when they're trying to do this. And you've done it in a really nice way because like your stablecoin palette basically just needs some notion of a thing that's going to tell you a price. Like you said, it can be this off-chain worker, like that seems like a pretty realistic one, or it can be like a fancier off-chain worker, or it could just be some kind of like dictatorship where there's like one key that dictates the price and that's the, the answer. And so that line 309 is where you're saying like, okay, concretely, since my stablecoin palette needs some notion of a thing that gives it the price, in this particular runtime, we're using this other, this other palette that I apparently is called price, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a really, that's a really nice pattern. And then I guess all those other associated types are like, uh, like constants pretty much, right? Yeah, th these are constants that are right now just set at initialization that could potentially be um, configurable numbers at runtime as well, right? You could say like, oh, we've noticed the exp expiration period of 100 blocks <laughs> that we used is, is a little short. Maybe we want to adjust it, right? And right now they're constants, but they, they could totally be made uh, um, things that can, change, can be changed by governance. Yeah, I just remembered the comment that I was going to make earlier. We were talking about like the, the frequency at which we fetch the price. And I was just thinking like it would be kind of cool if that fetch frequency could even be self-adjusting. Like if like sort of I sort of thinking of it in terms of like how in proof of work, the difficulty adjustment algorithm, uh, you know, makes the blocks harder or easier to mine. Like it would be cool if this thing noticed like, OK, I've been fetching the price every 10 seconds and it's hardly changed at all maybe I'll just kind of slow down to 20 seconds or 30 seconds. And then eventually it's like, whoa, this is getting kind of volatile. Like maybe I should start checking the price more frequently. That would be a kind of a cool thing to write. Interesting. Yeah, that's a cool idea. I like it. Yeah, I was wondering about that as well. Yeah. Yeah, I find it fascinating that you can, right, you can have like an algorithm like that decided. You can have a uh, fixed configuration. You can have governance decided. And it's, it's interesting to, to, to just like to see uh, what's the best strategy for, for this. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I, I haven't uh, deployed any stable coins. So. so this is how we sort of um, stick the things together. And then I think this could be a good time to just demo it so that we know sort of how, how this behaves. And then if you want, we can sort of explore into particular questions that, that you're interested in, um, like yeah. uh, how the, how certain parts of it work. Th that's a, that's great. I think that's a great idea, Alex. And just because I, I don't know if you're looking at the chat, Amar wants to talk about the storage adapters at some point. I, I think that's a good ah, idea. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah, happy to do that. Um, let's do the demo first so we have some idea and then we can jump into the code. All right, so um, I prepared something here, um, which... Fingers crossed, will work. Um, so I bu I'm building it just to show that it, that's what it usually does. And then I purge the chain right, of previous test runs that I've done. And then we do uh, a node template in a dev mode. And I chose execution native because I have some logging that's only done when it's uh, being run in a native context. Um, so we will be able to see 
uh, here, expanded supply by handing out coins, right? This is the initial um, at Genesis, um, the stable coin hands out coins to the shareholders. And this is this uh, that can, can be seen here. So the, that, that happened. And then um, you can see coin price is equal to base price as is desired. So in the, in the beginning, I just set the price to the right price uh, so that we don't have fluctuations in the beginning. And then we can see how it behaves if we, if we change that later. Um, this uh, log line, I was, uh, this logging uh, appears several times. I was surprised to see. And apparently this is the case because even though it's sort of stored, like evaluated and stored in the blockchain only once, it is called repeatedly if, um, if sort of uninitialized is called repeatedly um, if, uh, um, if you call uh, dispatchable functions in the blockchain. And this is apparently happening here. I, I don't know why it's, uh, yeah. So don't worry, this is only happening once. And then the, sort of the side effects to the blockchain only happening once. And um, so whenever it says imported number one, right, we have the block number one. And right now we are at 16. So um, in the background, I have the UI running, which you can see here. This is a custom fork that I made because um, of some UI element that I wanted. Um, so with uh, out of the box Polkadot UI, this will not work as advertised. Unfortunately, my change was a bit hacky and didn't ha like hasn't made it into the main repo yet. I'm sorry for that. So you can't try it out on the official like um, Polkadot.js, um, unfortunately. Um, so okay, cool. So what I um, what I did was I have um, both the chain state and the extrinsic here. So side to side, so we can see what's happening to, to the chain um, and, and interact with it. Just uh, reloading to make sure that we have a current um, WebSocket connection. Okay. So we wanna have a look at the price. See that it's 1 million as it should be. So 1 million in our test uh, runtime is the base unit. Um, which uh, should represent $1, one piece of gold, one ever. Um, then we have, um, for example, Alice is uh, one of the sort of shareholder accounts. Uh, so she has 250 million coins. Then we have the coin supply, which is 1 billion. And we can see the bids as well, which are empty because no one has bid it yet. And then uh, unfortunately, um, I don't have a good UI yet for the bonds. Um, I'm sorry that I can't show this in a nicer way. Um, this is the bonds range. So um, I built a ring buffer. And so you can see here the start index and the length. So because it's empty, it, it's zero, zero, right? So zero, zero means it's empty. And so if, then, if, uh, if the length is zero, it's, it's empty. And then this is the starting. Um, so what we can do now is we can uh, Bob is also a shareholder, um, so we can, so he will have gotten some coins, and so he can co send coins to Alice, for example, right? And then we can send a bunch of coins to Alice, and then now, well, this is taking a long time. Okay, all right, there we go, right? So now Alice has more coins, hopefully. There, there she, there she goes. Right, you can see the 350 million. Um, so, um, did, wait, why is it 350 million? Didn't we just send her an amount that started with a one? Yes, so it was 250 and we sent her a hundred. Oh, oh, okay, sorry, I missed it. Yeah, thanks. So. Math. So, so, um, so this is the, the, the custom input, right? I type in 0 0.9, so 0.9. Um, in, in German input types. And then we, let's say we want, we, Bob is wealthy now, um, or still wealthy. So he was 100, three, 100 million is how, how much we want in payout. And then we can see that it shows up in the, in the bids a little bit later. There we go. Um, so uh, the price is a it's called a purble, so per billion. So this is 900 million per billion. So it corresponds to 0 0.9. And then the quantity is 100 million as we entered it. And then maybe Alice also wants to uh, bid, but she's, uh, she wants a bit more bang for her buck. And so 
um, maybe you can name a price for me. You can decide how much he wants to bid for the. Yeah, maybe 55%. Okay, 55%. And maybe she's a bit more cautious and wants a little uh, smaller bond, right? And uh, only goes for 10 million. Right. Um, and so um, the, the bids are ordered uh, top to bottom from lowest to highest. So the, the sort of the, the top of our heap, right, of our priority queue is the bottom of the bids. So if I do 9-1 here, then it should, should show up, should show up at the bottom. And if I do 1, 2, uh, one, three, four. Uh, I don't know pi well enough. One, four, maybe something like that. Then it, it should show up at the top. All right. So we have a bunch of bids in the bidding queue. Um, let's say um, our price um, changes uh, and it um, is now instead of one million, it's. Um, uh, so this is the, this price palette that you're calling right now, this is the like sort of, this is the thing that's implementing our price fetch. Like your, your stable coin requires a price source and this is it. And it's not using the off-chain worker right now. It's like, uh, yeah. yeah, I got it. Okay. But the, we still saw logs from the off-chain worker. So like it, it's still in the runtime, I guess, but it's just. Yeah. Not yeah. I, 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 it was a bit lazy. I just was like, okay, have the off-chain worker running. So it always has a price. And then if we want it, we can sort of pull the price in. Yeah, it's running in the background. Okay, cool. Yeah, roger that. Right. So now we saw the price change. And then now the, because the price, so we have fewer coins per uh, dollar or whatever we're tracking. Um, the uh, amount of coins goes up because um, this is how much we pay for one dollar, right? So if we pay less than one million, it means that our coin is worth more than it should be. And so um, you see no changes to the bids. And what we're doing is we're just handing out coins to the shareholders, which is why Alice's account is increasing and why the coin supply is increasing. Right? So now um, we can use the off-chain worker. So there's this get off-chain price. And what it does is it goes to the to the off-chain worker pulls the current price of ether and sets that as a price. That's a, it's a fairly high one. Um, and so now the, the, um, the value of our stable coin is too low and that's why it will contract very quickly. That happened a bit more quickly than I would have expected, I have to admit. Okay. Maybe our, uh, our bits were not very, very big. Um, and then now it can't update. Hmm, that happened very quickly. I'll, I'll have to look into the code again. That surprised me. But you can see now that the length of the bonds is uh, four, right? So now we have a bunch of bonds in store. So if we set the price again- Here, hold, on, the... hold on a second, hold on. I'm gonna slow you down just to make sure I, I understood what happened. Sorry. So yeah. we've, we've experienced two price changes so far, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Like one you entered manually and that, that was saying the price of our coin went down a little bit. So in order to restore price stability, we had to, uh, that seems like we should have contracted the supply, right? When the price goes down, you pull coins back in to make them more scarce. So, um, so yeah, this is a bit confusing because it's the price of one US dollar actually. Oh. Right? So the price of one US dollar went down because we're paying uh, 999,000 mm -hmm. for every dollar. Oh, and that means oh, right? okay. it's inverted. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, so when you're like entering the price, you're not entering the price of like our stable coin denominated against, you know, whatever it's denominated against. Rather, it's the other way around the price yeah. of whatever the it's pegged to denominated in stable coin. And I just realized I should change it from coin price to asset price because it's the price of the asset that. that yeah. Was. Yeah. Okay. 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 So anyway, so I get it. So we, so at that first price change that you entered manually, we had to actually issue new tokens and mm -hmm. we did, and there were no bonds. Like we would have paid out bonds if we had them, but there weren't any. So we just did the fallback thing, which was like, send it over to the shareholders. And then you did another price change this time by like getting the ETH price. Um, 
And so now we need to actually contract the supply, I guess. Yep. And so the algorithm said like, well, if we want to contract the price, the way we do that is by like selling bonds. And once the bonds are sold, we take the, the money that people paid for those bonds and we just burn them. And that's how the, the supply goes down. Is that the idea? Yep. Okay, cool. That's the idea. Oh, and that's why people have bonds now. They just bought them. Exactly, right? Okay. Where the, yeah. the bids are gone and they're converted to bonds. And the thing that surprised me so much is how quickly the bids were gone and converted into bonds. That surprised me a bit. And I, I wonder whether I might have a buck in there somewhere because that happened more quickly than I expected. So, so is it not supposed to happen just like on the very next block that gets authored or is there supposed to be some kind of delay? Or like why were you expecting it to take some time? So um, if we look at the, the price, so the price is 1,685,000. That means that our, um, that our, um, so it's underpriced by uh, 68%, right? So that means, yeah, it does mean that we need to contract by quite a bit. Yeah, that, that's the thing. It's, uh, it's an extreme price change. So, um, so, we, so, um, so I can show you the code. Maybe that makes it clear. Maybe you can find, uh, find the bug if there is one in the, in the, in the code. So, no, this is the wrong one. This is also the wrong one. There we go. So we need to contract the supply, right? So what we do is we take the price and we take the base unit and we uh, divide them by each other. So in our case, this would be 1,685,000 uh, 1, divided by 1 million, right? So that means we get a, a number of 1.685. Uh, and then we subtract one from that, um, which means we have a number of 0 0.685. And this is a fraction. And then um, we multiply our supply by that fraction. And then this is the change. So um, if I have imp understood and implemented the white paper correctly, right? the white paper states that if the price is um, is for example, uh, so if the asset price, to, to make it less convenient, the asset price is 1.6, um, then we need to contract by 60%. Does that seem right? I think that seems roughly right to me. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm in presentation mode, so I, I'm not sure I can do the math properly yeah, here right sure. now. It's super, super hard to do that. Definitely <laughs> qualitatively, it seems right. I, I haven't thought through yeah. it and know if like the 68% the is right. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. This, this experiment made me think of another, like another thing here. So like, imagine we want to contract the supply and we've gone through all of our bonds. Oh, oh, oh we've gone through all of our bids. Like no one else has bid to buy any bonds. <laughs> You, I'm guessing you don't go to the shareholders and take their tokens back or yeah. <laughs> no, no. So it's actually if, so this is one of the key weaknesses of this system. And this is for me, that's the crux. Um, if there are no bids in the queue, the system cannot adjust. Mm -hmm. So if the price of the stable coin is too low, like it's not valuable enough, then, and there are no bids, it cannot adjust and it will just sort of, lose value and people will probably lose confidence. And mm -hmm. if there is no one that injects confidence by saying like, oh, I'm going to bid, I believe that this price will go up again at some point, mm -hmm. then like it'll, it'll just crash. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. I now, now that I'm thinking about it, like it's, it actually, so we're in the scenario right now where there are no bids at all and the system like desperately needs bids because it wants to contract supply. Like we really can bid anything we want. Like we could bid 1% or something and the system's going to take it. So this is another configuration parameter. Um, uh, Basis recommends a, a minimum price of 10%. Okay. Yeah. So you'll find here uh, we have 10% um, minimum bond price uh, to, um, to make sure that if, um, if there is a sudden drop in demand for, um, for bonds, that that doesn't lead uh, to arbitrarily low.
prices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's sort of it's limited how how much you're able to borrow against the future, so to speak. And this is like right the the lower this price, so if it's one percent, then that makes it a little bit more stable, but it also makes it sort of disadvantageous in that like it'll be very expensive to pay off that bond. And, 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 and so they did, apparently they did uh, economic modeling and determined that 10% was good. I have no idea what the right price is. That's one of those, yeah, yeah. one of those things. Yep. Um, but yeah, yeah, so we could, uh, so I was just about to give, uh, to have Alice uh, send off uh, a bond for, huh, interesting. Does she not? No, she should have enough. I wonder, I'm curious if we set her bid to like 0. 0.11 or something. Oh. Ah, yeah, yeah, that might also be it. Maybe it's a greater than versus greater than or equal to. Yep, yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, it was. I'm pretty sure it was. Right, so then at the next adjustment, right, it'll, it'll be gone again quickly. Cool. Um, so if we now change the price, uh... so so it sounds like you're you, you were initially surprised that we wiped out all those bids so fast, but maybe that's just because you didn't realize the magnitude of the the price change. Like it in hindsight, it actually makes sense because there was a drastic price fluctuation. Or, does that seem right? Yes. Yeah. It could make sense. I was just surprised, but it could make sense because it, it was the Ethereum price. It wasn't the the real yeah. price, right? So if we set it to um, if we set it to 1.001, so that's a, a one per mil, right? A sort of change, and then we bid, then this will look very different. All right, so now we should be able to see the, the quantity going down slowly. Yeah. So that in that case where we just needed to partially like contract a little bit, it didn't take her whole bid. So she got some bonds, but she still has a bid for the remainder of them out there. Exactly. Yep. 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 This is the, the partial, the partial um, conversion of bids to bonds. And then um, we can also, so let's go for bond index number zero. Um, yeah, this is probably expired by now. We've been talking for a little while. With yeah, how, often, how often do they expire or how long do they live, I guess? Th th that's configurable and I configured it to 100. So um, you could show it uh, sort of in a demo and it expires at 184 um, and we are at 185. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this will have expired, which we can see in action in a second if we change the price. Um, so. What happens is that if, if a bond is expired, it will um, it will just be um, like discarded, and that's a risk that you run when you buy bonds. Is that after so that what they recommend in the white paper is a period of five years. After five years, a bond expires and is is not pitched um, in, and you can see here that it's zero, which means the default value. Um, so we can have a look at number four, which seems. Oops, that seems to be still valid, right? And then now we can see how the bonds are paid out partially. Yeah, cool. All right. Um, a quick question here. Uh, why do bonds have expiration dates? Because to incentivize selling of them or? Um, so the reason for the expiration date is that you want people to keep bidding right the the, um, the 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 stability depends on people bidding you always want bids in the auction but if the if the bond queue gets too long there is no incentive to bid anymore because you don't expect your bond to be, be paid out in a reasonable tri uh, time frame right so with an expiration time of 5 years you know that if you buy a bond today right like there the, right like it, like there is like if, if you no the other way around so if there are bonds in the queue that are very old for example five years um, then 
even though even if the queue is very long, you know that it's, that there is some likelihood that at some point your bond will be paid out because they might expire and there might be a fluctuation uh, in in sort of in price later on. So I was reading the white paper and they they talked about like um, the way the Fed does it is that they sell bonds and those bonds never expire. And what that means, like basically each bond is just like attacking a little bit more debt on. And so you're sort of like, you have this situation where the debt of the system is constantly increasing, increasing, increasing. And so we're always like borrowing against the future, you know, like, yeah, we need to contract the supply right now. So sell some bonds, but like, you know, elephant in the room, there's a shitload of bond debt out there that we're going to have to pay back at some point. And so the, I think if I understood it right, the white paper was saying by setting an expiration time on bonds, you're, you're making buying bonds a little bit of a, you know, a gamble. But another way to say that is it's a little more incentive aligned. So you need to do an analysis of whether buying the bond at a particular price is is a good investment and we avoid the fact like that we're or we avoid the situation where we're always tacking on more and more debt into the system by knowing that like eventually those bonds might expire right yeah yeah true and uh, one question also like you know if i uh, you know let's say i own some bonds from the state and then i can trade them right i can sell them to other people and the expiration date is still on it like those people who borrow from me or buy from me, uh, basically they will also ha take that risk of expression date with them. So uh, the audio is a bit choppy, like the, the connection is, is not very good. I wonder what I can do to improve that. Uh, um, I can ask, I can try to ask again if it's, um, I just wanted to say, you know, if you trade the bond, and uh, you know when i sell the bond to someone else that person who purchased the bond will take the expiration uh, risk with it obviously right can, can you repeat what, wait i'm gonna restart the network for a second uh so when i trade the bond with someone else i own some bonds i trade it to, i sell it to someone else and then they take the risk of uh, the expiration risk of the bond right it is attached to the bond itself obviously Ah, so um, in my current implementation, you cannot trade bonds. Um, of course, in principle, you can make bonds tradable, and um, this this is an option that you could could follow. This is an, Thank this, you. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's like right now, they are tied to an account, but of course, you could tie the the bonds to some ID, and then have you know like have ownership associated with that, and then you could change the ownership of that bond ID, and uh, that would totally be possible. Um, and then, yeah, sure, someone else could shoulder the risk or something, yeah, and you could have a, like a second order market in trading these bonds. Um, I think, so if I think about it, um, you don't want people trading bonds a lot. You want them to bid for bonds. So okay. this second order market of bonds might be in competition with the bidding market. And so, on one hand, it would probably increase the value of a bond because you could maybe sell it later and stuff, but also it would um, potentially uh, compete against the bidding that the, and, and that's the most crucial part, right? What you want to make sure is that people bid on the, on the thing. So I'm, I'm not sure, like, I'm not enough on an, of an economist to be able to say whether that's a good idea. It but seems it's like one of those things that's a whole research project before it goes into production. <laughs> maybe, it oh, yeah. be, maybe it would be totally undermine security or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I Thank like, you, Alex. yeah, after implementing this, like I wouldn't just want to start a stable coin. Like that's, that's like a two year project with like, you know, like an ICO or like investment or whatever. And like researchers and, and all the kinds of things like, yeah, it's not a thing that you just do willy nilly. So Alex, do you want to, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Burak. Go ahead. No, it's fine. I was going to just say like, this is a very nice framework to play with. And then you don't have to create a stable coin with this only, you know, you can really, you know, be creative and then use this infrastructure to make other things as well. I think it's a very good, good uh, demo. Thank you for that, Alex. All right. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, I have seen in some other implementations of uh, algorithm like uh, stable coins. So there is an option to redeem the bonds at VY. So uh, suppose if the price drops and uh, people uh, bid and uh, get the bonds, once the price comes back uh, as the gate supplies, 
it is possible to uh, redeem those bonds and uh, in terms of the coin back itself is there such an option in this particular implementation i'm so sorry like my like so that was a uh, choppy for all of us i think okay yeah. so, okay so all right maybe just re try to repeat that question one more time and we'll be able to catch it yeah. we can also yeah, sorry we can also put it in the chat if you like yeah so my question is uh, in some implementations of uh, algorithmic stable coins it is possible to redeem the bonds that people buy so when the price drops people buy the people make bids and they buy the bonds so once the price stabilizes uh, what they do is they they give the option to redeem those bonds uh, back to the coins so do we have such a option here in this implementation you were asking how the bonds are redeemed or Yes. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Yes. So, um, so they currently, and and uh, yeah. Okay. So currently in this implementation and the way that is specified in the white paper, um, the bonds are paid out when there when we need uh, an expansion. So if we need to inflate, if we need to um, decrease the value of the stablecoin, then we pay out the bonds. So the system decides. Oh. The, the price is such that we need to increase the coin supply and then it pays out the bonds. And the rule is um, according, so I can, I can go to the top front, I think was the, and I'm in the runtime again. Top front, right? And the rule is it's just a FIFO queue. So it just takes the oldest bond and pops it from the queue when we need to expand the supply. And then it decides, oh, is this expired? Well, if it's expired, then discard. Um, and then if it's not, then we pay out. And this is a little bit more complex because we can do this partial, partial fulfillment of the bond, this partial payout. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry, I had trouble with the audio. Uh, sorry. So uh, how do people uh, redeem the bond? So for example, if the price has dropped and I have uh, made some bits and I've got some bonds, so at what price will I be able to redeem it? So uh, in other implementation, it is possible to redeem it at the base price level itself. Suppose if uh, $1 is the price of uh, the base stable coin, and uh, if price drops to, let's say, 90 cents, and I buy like 100 uh, bonds, that I make some bits and I buy some uh, bonds at 90 cents. So it's possible in other implementation to redeem those coins at $1 itself when the price stabilizes. So uh, how does the redeem, uh, how do people redeem it in this particular mm -hmm. point? At what price will they be able to? Ah, okay. So um, currently the way this is implemented is that um, the, you bid for the amount that you want to be, to get redeemed. So you bid, for example, for 1 million coins, and then your bond will be 1 million coins or a partial fulfillment of that. So the amount might potentially be less, but that's because it's only partially fulfilled, right? This is this thing. But if you buy a bond for 1 million, uh, 1 million coins, you will get 1 million coins in the future. So, um, or, it and or, or it expires, yeah, then, then you're out of luck. But yeah, um, right. So um, if you bid for a bond for 1 million, um, 1 million coins, then you will get 1 million coins. And there is no adjustment of the, of the payout um, whatsoever. The, the, the adjustment is all in the bidding where you, where you decide which price you would buy, uh, like to bid at. So Alex, speaking of paying out the bonds, I understand you're, you're even have it highlighted on your screen here, this pop front method. And I know like with substrate storage, we've looked at the decal storage macro and you can do like, single storage values, or you can do these storage maps and everything. But uh, I've seen you do some fancy storage stuff like this FIFO queue, and you recently wrote a recipe for a ring buffer. So like, what's up with that? How does it work? That seems cool. Right. <laughs> um, uh, so the pop front is from the storage adapters. So someone asked about this in the chat earlier as well. Um, I changed the naming slightly and made it a bit simpler, yay, but that's not in the recipes yet. I, I, wanna, I will update that, so there's, there will be a, a pull request incoming. Um, so I, I renamed it to bounded deck because it's a double-ended queue. Um, and so the, the pop front is from that, uh, from that data structure. And so what it does is um, um, you might remember the, that I 
showed you the, the bonds range, I think it's called. And the bonds range was these two things, the start and the length. And so what we do is we implement this double init queue on top of the storage by storing two things. One is, the, is, the, is this tuple of start and length. And the other thing is a map that maps an index to an item. So an item in our, can, in our case would be a bond. So we get a, a double-ended queue of bonds by storing them in a map and then we access them with the indices. And then the pop works by, well, if it's empty, then we return none. And otherwise we take the, the starting index that we have stored, um, well, yeah, the, the, we take the starting index and we take the item out of the map. Right, and then with take, it's it's not in the storage anymore, and we have it, and then we can we can return it, and then we update the the indices accordingly. And one of the reasons why I wanted to do this was because um, we need the start and length, um, and in in this code, right, we might call pop several times, but if we write the these this bonds range every time, then we get a lot of storage rights that we don't need because um, we, like, we will pop a few times and only at the end of the function do we really want to store the, the, the bonds range again, right? We might have popped three items, so that, so that means that we need to sort of increase the start index by three, um, and then we only store it once. And the reason, so one of the reasons why I wrote this uh, is that um, this implements drop and that means, oh, and then now we get into a lot of rust stuff. So it, it, it sort of, it, it writes this metadata on the, on the commit, on the drop. So that means that here at the end of the function, the, uh, the queue, um, uh, commit, All right? Here at the end of the, at, at the, end of the function, um, the, the bonds are dropped. Uh, in, in Rust terms, so the, the, the value is deallocated. And on that deallocation, um, we, uh, we commit to the storage. And that way, um, even though we've popped several times, we only need to um, write to the database once to store the, to store the, the, the metadata, so to speak. That was a very quick uh, rush through. That was thing. really good. Thank you. Uh, that was good. Cool. Seems like it'll be so useful. Yeah, it's like, and I, like custom data structures that like cache the edits, you know, to the um, data structure. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah and the, the part I like about it, like, yeah, as you said, it's like a little bit rust technical and everything, but like the, the beauty of the drop thing is like you, you could imagine someone wanting to use a data structure like this and making a couple mutations to this like storage adapter like you're talking about and then forgetting to call dot commit at the end. And then like if I'm understanding the the beauty of what you've done with that drop trait is that like as soon as this storage adapter gets deallocated, like yeah, for example, this function finishes executing, then like even if you, you know, forgot, then automatically all the changes are going to be committed to the underlying actual storage. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's the idea of it. That the with the default usage, it's gonna do the thing that you expect it to do or that you would want it to do if you were coding it yourself. Um, and then if if you want some sort of custom behavior, you can either write a, like a different version of this of this data structure, right, and not implement drop, or you say um, like you can do things like mem forget or whatever uh, if you if you want to do it yourself manually, or if you want to do it in between, you can just call commit, right? You can just do it in between if that's necessary for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. So Alex, so like if I want to use one of these things in my own runtime. I mean, so like you wrote a double-ended queue here, you know, and you used it for this like bonds thing, but a double-ended queue has a ton of applications. So like how, if I wanted to use one of these things myself, like do I still use the decal storage macro or like, how does that work? How do I? Mm, yeah. Right, yeah, did let's look at the usage. Decal storage macro? Hmm? Did you use the decal storage macro here? So, um, so the beauty is, um, th this is one of the this is one of the points where I was like impressed with Substrate because um, I have this storage adapter crate, 
And um, yes, I import a few, a few types that I need. But apart from that, this is just generic code. And I just say, if I get something that uh, conforms to this interface, to the storage value trait, and to the storage map trait of this, of this kind, then I can work with that. And so this doesn't work. This does like the, 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 the generic implementation of the bounded uh, double NAQ doesn't use um, the, it doesn't even use the storage directly. It just, uh, it just uh, expects the interface and it doesn't use the declare storage macro. And then in the stable coin, I use, uh, let, let's go here. Um, in, in here, I specify the type, right? I say, I want a bounded uh, double NAQ. I want to store bonds in there. I want, Want to, uh, I wanted to use this storage um, value as the range for the metadata. And I wanted to store my bonds here in this storage map. And then this is the index type that I would like you to use, right? And then I just call this function whenever, whenever I want to access my bonds. And it will load the, the metadata from, from the storage with the right bounds. Then I can call pop and, and so on. And these are just, here I'm just normally in my crate, right? This is part of my, my module and here I'm in the whole, like this is a regular number crate, uh, palette as you would expect it to be. Yeah, okay, I get it. So like in this, this stable coin palette we're looking at is like a really concrete palette. It has its own storage, you know, it, it is a regular old like runtime palette. And so it, in, in this file somewhere you have decal storage and you've created like, um, I mean, I don't know, whatever the necessary storage items are, but then the way that you use them is not by directly calling like their, you know, put or get or like whatever their methods are, but instead, yeah, oh yeah, you're, you're highlighting it right there. So you call it through this like interface. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why I called it a storage adapter, right? Because like, yes, of course it still uses the storage under the hood. Um, here, I still, I still call get, and I still call put here somewhere, right? I still use the storage. It's just that the, the generic implementation knows how to do that. And I can instead um, do things like uh, call pop on it or um, bonds push there, push front, right? This is the, the, right? We do pop front to take the bond out. And if we, don't, if we only partially fulfill it, we push it back onto the front of the, of the queue. Yeah. Great. Cool. Yeah, and if you wanted to use this, so it's, I'm not sure it's quite production ready yet, but um, if, if you wanna use it for something more real, like for now you can just use this Git repository and say that you want the storage adapters crate, like the, it's just, and it's just a crate, right? You can just um, import it and use it. And of course, if you do like, feel free to reach out to me and we can try and make it, make it more production ready and write a bit more tests and such. Cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a really cool pattern. I hope that this really takes off because like working with substrate storage is definitely one of the pain points, you know, like you get some coder who comes in to substrate and is like, okay, I know what I want to do. I know what in the abstract, what data structures I need. And then it's like, whoa, I only have these couple primitives in the substrate storage. So I think this could really ease that. Yeah. Yeah. That's my hope too. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I also built a, a, uh, the priority queue. So the priority queue we actually we use in the stable coin is actually is another one, uh, and it's sort of it's it's a little bit different. It's not quite as smart. It just has these items that are just a vector, and so it doesn't like it's not much more write efficient. Yeah, I mean it's more write efficient than a very dumb, <laughs> naive usage, but it's not much more write efficient than that. But but it's sort of nice in that it also provides the like push function and pop functions and. And yeah. it does the sorting for you and you don't have to worry about it. Cool. Yep. All right, last call for questions or comments or anything like that. And otherwise we can just end a few minutes early. Anybody wanna share anything? Okay, cool. Well, thank you very much, Alex. I really appreciate you coming on and showing us your stable coin and this storage adapters idea. Yeah, very cool and useful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Yeah, it was cool. Thanks. All right. See you guys next week. Bye, guys. Yeah. Bye. Yeah.